All right, now let's look at verse 17. You ever heard churches talking about double application? That is, they don't do that. You know what? They all apply this at a first century timeline of the ADs. Boy, you're missing out. You're missing out, man. All right, verse 17. He that hath an ear. Okay, y'all got ears? All right. Let him hear. Are you hearing? What the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we see church age application right here, see? So are you churches listening up? Yeah, you better listen up. To him that overcometh. Okay, now here's the doctrine you've been waiting for. This is going to be fun. To him that overcometh. If you overcome... Will I give to eat of the hidden manna? God's going to give you some sort of hidden manna that you're going to be eating. So he's going to give some kind of manna that he hid. But he's going to reveal that manna if you overcome. And will give him a white stone. So you're also going to get a white stone. Now I know that this is blue, okay? But just consider this white, okay? I'll just write white here so that you don't get confused. He's going to also give a white stone and in the stone a new name written. So he's going to put your new name in there. Which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So that's interesting. No man, no one knows this name. <clears throat> All righty, so let's look at a few applications right here, which will be interesting. But both applications are going to be interesting. Double application, right? All right, let's look at a church age application right here. Dr. Ruckman, this is one of his famous verses where he says, Ich weiß nicht. And some arrogant Bible believers, they feel like, ooh, I got the answer, so that they can look smarter than Dr. Ruckman. So I don't propose to be that type of person. I don't believe in that kind of stuff. Usually people that, that introduce some new doctrine, I kind of don't like that, even if they act humble. So the thing is this, is that I believe that if God's going to bless you with more knowledge and doctrine, you, also, you always have to have a spirit of humility. So in my case right here, what I'm going to do is this, is that I'm going to give you the church age application <clears throat> and the doctrinal application toward tribulation. And I'm also going to say this, like I always said in my other teachings. I'm going to always say if I give something new, that I'm not sure, but I'm theorizing here, okay? And whenever I do that, that gives more, that is actually more of a blessing anyway for you people to study it more for yourselves and to see, to investigate it. See, it just motivates you to study and see if it's true or not. So I'm going to put it as a theory. Okay, here we go. Let's have some fun. This will be a perfect time to say let's close, right? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> So God gives you to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. Now, what we could say is this. Go the, concerning the manna part, let's go to John, the book of John, <clears throat> chapter 6. John, chapter 6. For a church age application, this could be referring... To Jesus Christ giving us his own bread from heaven when we got saved. Well, I don't believe in that. No, it happens when you get saved. Look at John chapter 6. <clears throat> Notice the Bible says in verse 48, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Ah, uh, there's a different manna here. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread. See, so Jesus Christ could be that bread for you. Now, this is very interesting. <clears throat> this is known as actually angel's food. Now, Satan himself... Is an angelic was an angelic being. Uh, he was more specifically and accurately a cherubim, not just an ordinary angel. But <clears throat> here's something more wild. Didn't you know that this is Satan's head? Oh, you didn't hear of that before, huh? Oh, give me the verse on that one. Uh, I'll tell you to watch my video. So the video, 
that you can watch online is, uh, uh, oh wow, I forgot the title. It's, it was a good one. Uh, sacri uh, human Sacrifices of the Antichrist. Human Sacrifices of the Antichrist. Watch that video. The Bible shows that the book of Psalms that the children of Israel, when they ate manna in the wilderness, it was from the Leviathan's head. It was from Satan's head. So you can, that's the book. So you can look at the book of uh, Psalms, uh, watch the video on that one. So this all matches up right here then. So this angel's food right here, Jesus Christ offers it to them, but more specifically, it's from him. And he's actually known as the angel of the Lord. Didn't you know Jesus Christ? The angel of the Lord, now if you stu uh, watch my video or my audio recording of the angel of the Lord, I showed you that the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ. So when you Christians got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're of this angel's food that God has given to you. When you get saved, you're nourishing in it right now, spiritually. So that's a spiritual church age application. Now, let's keep going back here. So then notice right here, he says, give to eat of the hidden manna, right? Now let's look at a doctrinal application toward the tribulation. Look at the book of Micah. Book of Micah. What's the doctrinal application right here, Pastor? Didn't you know that in the tribulation, God Almighty is going to feed his people, the Jews, Manna from heaven. Didn't you know that? Oh, I didn't know that. What? Tim LaHaye never said that before. Where did I learn this in the Bible? See, you got to be a Bible believer. When you're a Bible believer, then the Lord's going to show you more things than you never thought of before. Look at Micah chapter 7, verse 14. Micah chapter 7, verse 14. <clears throat> Now, let's look at the context right here. If we look at the context, then we know that this is referring to a tribulation timeline. Micah chapter 7, and we will read verse 12. In that day also he shall come. See that? So it's a future reference. That day, that day. Look up that phrase, that day, throughout your Bible. It's a prophetic timeline toward a future advent. Close to the tribulation or in the tribulation. He shall come even to thee from Assyria and from the fortified cities and from the fortress even to the river and from sea to sea and from mountain uh, to mountain. Notwithstanding, the land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein for the fruit of their doings. Not only that, uh, look at verse 16, the nation shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. So notice right here that God's talking about one day these foreign nations, they're going to one day recognize the king of kings. And they're going to worship and bow before him. Look at verse 20. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. God restores the nation of Israel. Amen. Now think about it. When does God conquer the nation? All the nations worship God and he restores the nation of Israel. That's the end times, right? <clears throat> That's the end times. So we know right here this is a tribulation application. Now, what did God say he's going to do at verse 14? Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in what? The days of old. Of what timeline? What old days? According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt. Think about it. How did God feed his people with the rod when they left Egypt? What is he talking about? Moses with that rod. And how did God feed them as of the days of old? What was their diet that time that they complained about? Manna. 
And Revelation chapter 2 is a book on end times, right? What did God said? I'm going to give them to eat of the hidden manna. Amen. So a doctrinal tribulation application is God going to feed those Jews. Why, pastor? Because they reject the mark of the beast, Revelation 13, where you cannot buy or sell. You cannot eat. You cannot eat. So then here are the Jews, and they're starving, and then God feeds them with the rod. Well, how is he going to do that without Moses? Malachi chapter 4, God sends down Moses and Elijah. Amen. Revelation chapter 11, you see Moses and Elijah's workings in there. Blood, uh, water turned into blood, plagues, etc. Scripture with scripture. Amen. Left behind never taught me that. No, it sure didn't, man. All right, let's go back to our main text. Hey, this is just one of them. This is going to get better. Let's look at this one. Let's look at Revelation 2. So that's the hidden manna part. Now let's talk about that new name in the white stone. Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> Spiritual application, church age. And will give him a white stone, in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Okay, spiritual application. The church right here receives a new name, and it's white. And it's a name that no one can understand. Look at the book of Numbers, chapter 28, and 1 Peter, chapter 2. Numbers, chapter 28, and 1 Peter, chapter 2. Now, you know what? What is very interesting... I don't know if you paid attention when the song leader was directing the songs. What was one of the hymns that we sing? There is a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. But here's the thing is that do you understand what you're singing? It's a new name that no one knows about. When you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, God already gave you a new name that no one knows about. Why is that, Pastor? Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Right. Old things are passed away. Gene Kim is passed away. Amen. Behold, all things are become new. You're no longer Gene Kim. I give you a new name. You are going to be this. Amen. Now, here's something very interesting concerning about new names. Whenever God gave a new name to a person, did you ever pay attention? He gave it to them in Hebrew. Where's that, Pastor? Old Testament, you're no longer called Jacob. You're called Israel. That's what God says. And that was what? In Hebrew, God spoke to him. What did God say to Abraham? Your name shall no longer be called Abram, but Abraham. And what was he doing? He was speaking in Hebrew that time. There you go. Paul, he wanted to be very close to something like a new name. So in, if you read your New Testament, which is very interesting, the New Testament said he was originally called Saul, but then he switched his name to Paul, which is very interesting. <coughs> but Paul, that's probably the closest you'll ever see in the New Testament about an old man changing into a new man. But what you're going to notice throughout the Bible is that when God gives the name himself, is that it was always in Hebrew when he gave that name. So this is very interesting. Your God is actually a Hebrew God too. You know that, right? Amen. Your God is a Hebrew God. How do you know that, Pastor? Because Jesus, where do you think he was born from? He wasn't born from Korea, Africa, or United States of America. He was born from Israel. Your God is a Jewish Hebrew God. And then what did God say about Jesus' name? His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. God gave that name to his son, and that was in Hebrew. God gives, how God gives names is names that have meaning in them, you must understand. He gives names that has meaning within, within them, and it's in a Hebrew context. That's what you're going to notice. And you'll notice that God, he did this before with, look at this, Numbers chapter 28. And then notice what the Bible says concerning about these stones right here. Uh, okay, I, I hate it when this happens, so I got the wrong book. So, so Leviticus, Leviticus 28, 
it's not Leviticus, then it's uh, Exodus, then. I hate it when I get the wrong number. No, there's no Leviticus 28. <laughs> Exodus 28. Yes, it's Exodus 28. I got the wrong book. Exodus 28. Now look at this now. This is as close as you're going to get it in your Bible concerning about a name engraved in stones. This is the closest you're going to get. And by the way, these are Hebrew names. Verse 9. And thou shalt take two onyx stones and grave on them the names of the children of Israel. Six of their names on one stone and the other six names of the rest on the other stone according to their birth. That's the closest you're going to get. Hebrew names engraved on two onyx stones on a priest's outfit. Why is that important? First uh, Peter 2. You don't read your Bibles, do you? Look at First Peter 2. There's your spiritual application. Don't be hyper-dispensationalist now because you're robbing a church blessing here. Here's a blessing for the church. You're a spiritual Jew. You're a spiritual priest of God. Don't be hyper-dispensational saying 1 Peter only applies to the tribulation. When you do that, you rob a Christian of blessing. Look at right here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Ye also as what? Lively stones. Ooh, you are a stone. What? Are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. Wow. The priest has the names, uh, two stones and names on them. Am I likened to that? Yes. You are a spiritual priest of God who's a spiritual stone building up to that priest. That's why you got a new name. And it's in Hebrew spiritually how about that to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god by jesus christ that's the spiritual application to the church so it's a you have a new name in hebrew that no one knows about and why you are that is because the church is a spiritual priest of god that's why you don't need any priest to confess your sins to you know why? You are automatically a priest of God spiritually. By the way, this is something very interesting. It said a white stone, correct? All right, in Numbers chapter 28, if we're going to get the closest to this, it calls it an onyx stone. Onyx stones, they're normally black, not white. But you know what they do? Sometimes it has bands of white or black. It sometimes alternates. And you know what? Uh, you know how different religious people saw that as? See, sometimes pagans have more spiritual insight than some Christians sometimes. Spir a lot of the pagans and other people who are trying to find a spiritual meaning in that, they said this, is that the blackness of the onyx stone was referring to the darkness of your heart, but then the whiteness is the purity that came out after that. So then you transformed into a new birth or something white. Wait a minute, aren't we, don't we have a new birth in Jesus Christ where the blackness of our sin is washed away and we got a new name written down in glory? Now that book will blow up your mind every single time. How about that? Now let's look at the doctrinal application right over here. So then the tribulation saint, notice that he can be given a white stone, a stone, a new name written that no man knows saving he that receiveth it which is pretty true because look at Isaiah 61. In the tribulation, you'll notice that these Jews, after they come out of the tribulation and their nation is restored, God gives them a new Hebrew name. We're going to we're gonna look at the book of Isaiah and we're going to look at chapter 62, chapter 62, and we will read verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. So God, see, he's talking about Israel when they're restored. So this is after the tribulation. And thou shalt be called by a what? New name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. 
But that is if you overcome. Look at the context of Revelation 2. See, you have to overcome. Isn't that what the verse says in Revelation 2? If you overcome, then God will do that. That's why we see right here that for a Christian church application, how we overcome is because we believed on Jesus Christ for our salvation. 1 John chapter 5. I already explained that a long time ago, right? When we talked about Church of Ephesus. But then I also told you that this overcoming, if you're going to look at Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22, the overcoming has to do with tribulation saints doing faith and works for salvation. So see, they're totally different from Christians in their salvation and in God's plan and setup. And these people, their overcoming is literally overcoming the Antichrist. See, they have to work hard to fight and resist against him not yield into his mark and etc. See? So all of this kind of stuff, you see a double application. I'm telling you, man, if you're a hyper dispensationalist insisting everything is only tribulation, and if you're a anti-dispensationalist or a person who denies dispensational salvation, who refuses to see a tribulation application right here, you're gonna miss out a blessing. Double application you get an enrichment of Bible, biblical, proper interpretation and a wealth of doctrine you never saw before. Amen. Double application, double application, double application is right dispensationalism. Not hyper-dispensationalism or a weak form of dispensationalism or anti.